All right, good morning, Christ Community Church. We're going to go ahead and get started. Our 1030 service. He played, that's right. So the problem with like having our 9 o'clock get out and then the 1030 get here is like there's this meeting in the middle of the services, which is a beautiful problem because everyone like see each other and like hangs out and talks. But then we start at 1030 and no one's here yet. They're still talking outside. But fellowship is good. We love it. I'll never complain about that. Well, maybe one day. Who knows? All right. My name is Stephen Watson. I'm so glad to have you here today. If you are with us for the first time, a few things that you should know about. We have welcome cards. You can do it digitally by texting the word CCC guest to the number 94,000. Or there is an offering box outside with some welcome cards by it. You can fill out that welcome card and drop it in the box. Also, if you'd like a bulletin, this is for anybody. You can text the number 94,000 and text the word bulletin to it, and it will send you all of our updates, announcements, and uh, it also has on our finan financial information. It's a page on our website that it will take you to, essentially, that serves as our bulletin. Uh, so you can go there to find out upcoming events and everything else. We are doing what we call church together. That means a few different things. One, it does mean we are trying to do our best to social distance. Also, we're wearing our masks during this service, and also, uh, we have tons of space in front of your seats. Allow your kids to use that space. We are, we are doing church together, so kids are in the worship service with us. But that is only for this week. Next week, our nursery and our child care is starting back up. So if you are a parent and you're wanting to put your kids in children's church or in nursery, there are some letters from Lindsay, our children's director, on these middle tables just pick one of those up on, on your way out, and they'll kind of tell you what you need to know for children's church and nursery next week. Nursery is going to be for both services. So whether you show up for 9 o'clock or 1030, we'll have a nursery happening the whole service. That's birth through three years of age. However, uh, if your child is pre-K through fourth grade, children's church is only during the 10 o'clock or the 1030 hour. Um, and so what we do with our children's church, those pre-Kers through fourth grade, they will actually come to the church service with you, and you will, you'll be with them through the announcements, through the call to worship, through the songs, through confession, assurance of pardon, and then also communion. And then after communion, your child will meet their teachers out in this hallway, and they'll take them to their classes, and then you'll pick them up downstairs in the lobby after the service. Uh, but we believe that children are an important part of the community of faith, and so we want them to be in the service as much as, as possible. And you don't have to use Children's Church if you don't want to. If you like your kids in the service, we love that, and they're always welcome. They don't bother us. All right, that's our Children's Church. Whenever you see this sign next Sunday, that's going to be your indication that Children's Church can leave. So that's what it will look like right after Communion. We are doing a book club. We just finished up the book club as a church. What we do is we p pick the same book. We read a chapter a week, and then on Friday, Neil, Pastor Neil and I will release a podcast discussing that chapter. We just finished the book, Caring for One Another, and we're about to start a new book, which is called The Life of the Church. So if you don't have that book, you can find it on Amazon. We link to it in our weekly emails, and you can buy it that way. And then we'll start here in a few weeks on, on those podcasts and reading through. We are going to be the light on Halloween, so if your conscience allows you to, uh, we are going to have different parties connected with each community group meeting throughout the city in front yards. I'm planning on having cornhole at mine, a canopy, and some music, and hot dogs, and all that good stuff. We're doing that in our front yards so that we can welcome our neighbors as they come out uh, knocking on doors to trick-or-treat. We're going to have uh, tasteful tracks. We're going to have... It's sad that I have to say tasteful, right? <laughs> but... <laughs> don't, don't let me scare you off when I say tracks. They're going to be tasteful. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to be doing tracks. We're going to have invitations for church and then also like coupons for free food at Texas Roadhouse. Uh, so we're going to be passing those out along with any candy that you, might, that you might have. That's going to be on Halloween. If you're part of a discipleship group or community group, you'll find out where yours is there. If you're not a part of one, we're posting the addresses in our weekly email and possibly even in our bulletin, uh, and that, that will kind of let you pick the one closest to your house that you would like to attend. What's that? 
I'm not. But I don't, I don't dress up. <laughs> I'm the most boring person. I have no fun. But Mike Wynn, if you want to dress up, hey, I'm I game. Mine, so so okay. Luke, Luke's dressing up. Luke's dressing up. So, yeah, if you want to dress up, go ahead. Please do. Um, all right, Christ Community Church, last announcement. We have a next step meeting. That's going to be on November 1st. After this service, we'll gather in my front yard. We'll have some barbecue sandwiches, and we'll discuss our church about what we believe, what we value as a church, and we'll just kind of share our stories together. If you'd like to go to that meeting, just let me know, or you can text, or not text, you can email office at christ.community and reserve a seat that way. But that's going to be on November 1st after this service. Christ Community Church, let us stand for our call to worship. The book of Isaiah, chapter 12, verse 5, says, Sing to the Lord, for He has done glorious things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Christ Community Church, let's lift our voices to let one another know how great our God is. Sing, you are my vision. You are my vision, O King of my heart. Nothing else satisfies only you, Lord. You are my best thought by day. my wisdom. You are my wisdom. You are my true word. I ever with you and you with me, Lord. You're my great father and I'm your true son. Dwell inside me together we're one You're my battle shield You are my battle shield sword for the
Heart of my own heart. Heart of my own heart. Whatever be still be my vision, O ruler of all. I hear. Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe Sin I left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin I left a crimson stain he washed it white as Sin had left a crimson stain. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Sin is out. Oh, praise the one. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the the one who pays our debt and that he raised us from death to life. So let's sing it out. Oh, praise the
life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. We'll praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Jesus. Amen. Y'all can take a seat. We had a debt that only Christ himself could pay. We couldn't be good enough. We couldn't have the right enough information. The only way that our sin could be paid for, that when we sinned against God, was through the blood of Christ. The book of Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, speaking of the day of the Lord, said, On that day you will say, I will give thanks to you, Lord, Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Indeed, God is my salvation and I will trust him and I will not be afraid. For the Lord, the Lord himself is my strength, my song. He has become my salvation. Christ Community Church, our salvation has come in Jesus Christ. He has adopted us into his family. We are his. So let us draw near to his throne of grace this morning, confessing our sins to him. Let's take the, let's take the next few moments and do that silently. The prophet Isaiah continues. He says, You will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. On that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his name. Make his works known among the peoples. Declare that his name is exalted. Heavenly Father, we praise your name concerning your salvation that you are not stingy with it. But Lord, it says that, that the springs of salvation are full and they are free. You have called to us. And you said, come all who are thirsty, come and drink. Come and eat, you who are hungry, without cost, without expense, come. Lord, your generosity is available for the whole world. So we thank you for your salvation in our own lives. And Father, may we continue to share the good news of that salvation to others. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Isaiah, whenever he does say, Come to me, all you who are thirsty. Come to me, all you who are hungry. Come, eat and drink without cost. Whenever I read those verses in Isaiah, it can't help but lead my mind to the, to the ceremony called the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. Because here we have literal food and drink reminding us that in Christ salvation is there, it's for us, and it's free. So this act is, is a community act. This Lord's Supper is a community act where we remember the broken body of Jesus. We remember his spilt blood. We are encouraged by it. And we are reminded of the covenant that we have with our God. If you are visiting with us today, you're not a member of Christ Community Church, but you are a believer in Christ, we invite you to participate with us, to eat the bread, to drink the cup, to remember Christ's sacrifice for you. However, if you're not a Christian, or if you're a Christian and living in sin, not repenting, we ask that when I bring these elements to you, that you just say, not today, Pastor, and I'll say a prayer for you, and we'll move on. There's no shame. There's no embarrassment in that. But it is a family meal where we rejoice in Christ's sacrifice for us. The scripture teaches us that on the night that Christ was betrayed, he was with the disciples in the upper room. 
He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, then, Christ took the cup and said, This cup represents my blood, blood which was shed for the forgiveness of many sins. Christ Community Church, as often as we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we are proclaiming Christ until he comes again. So come, let us eat and drink with thanksgiving. I'm going to be delivering these elements to you. So if you're new, this is how it works. I'll be suiting up here, putting on my mask and my gloves. I'll bring the elements to you. The juice is in the top. The bread is in the bottom. And I'll actually set the elements on a table closest to you.
Today's reading is from the first book of Samuel, chapter 27. 1 Samuel chapter 27. David said to himself, One of these days I'll be swept away by Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I'll escape from him. So David set out with his 600 men and went over to Achish, son of Maok, the king of Gath. David and his men stayed with Achish in Gath. Each man had his family with him, and David had his two wives, Achinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. When it was reported to Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. Now David said to Achish, If I have found favor with you, let me be given a place in one of the outlying towns so I can live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? That day Achish gave Ziklag to him, and it still belongs to the kings of Judah today. The length of time that David stayed in Philistine territory amounted to a year and four months. David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. From ancient times, they had been inhabitants of the region through Shur as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he did not leave a single person alive, either man or woman, but he took flocks, herds, donkeys, camels, and clothing. Then he came back to Akish, who inquired, Where did you raid today? David replied, the south country of Judah, the south country of the Jeramalites, or the, the south country of the, the Kenites. David did not let a man or woman live to be brought to Gath, for he said, or they will inform on us and say, this is what David did. This was David's custom during the whole time he stayed in the Philistine territory. So Achish trusted David thinking, since he has made himself repulsive to his people Israel, he will be my servant forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mike. So today we find ourselves working our way through the book of 1 Samuel. The end is in sight. There's 31 chapters in the book of 1 Samuel. We're in chapter 27, and we are talking about David's compromise in 1 Samuel chapter 27. Just last week, we were talking about how David was making good decisions. He was trusting in God, but something happened at the end of 26 and the beginning of 27 that hurt his confidence. And we find that whenever our confidence in God is attacked, whenever our confidence in God is is hurt, this actually leads us to compromising our faith. That a lack of confidence leads to compromise. I was, I was thinking about my own lack of confidence, typically my lack of confidence in anything athletic. Anything athletic, I just have like no confidence. I enjoy doing sports, but man, I, I was just, I've never had the confidence where I'm smooth at it. So my coach in basketball always said, Stephen, you're you're too stiff, like loosen up and like get in there. Um, in fact, I, I was thinking about this week, well, about one of my instances of a lack of confidence was five years ago. It was May the 4th on 2015. So it's like Star Wars Day, right? May, May, May the 4th. Uh, so Star Wars Day, 2015, I was on a mountain biking trip. I had never been mountain biking before in my life, but I was at a, on a church staff and they said, we want to do a staff development day, and we're going to go mountain biking. So we went out locally to Dana Peak Park, and for about an hour, we read these nice, smooth, flat trails around the lake, and it was absolutely gorgeous. I could tick off all the things. It was calming. It was relaxing. It was easy. It's my type of exercise, right? So it was good, and we were driving back towards the cars, and the leader of our group stopped, and he said, all right, if we go straight, we're going to go to the cars. If we turn here, we're going to hit the really fun stuff. 
and I should have known because he learned how to mountain bike in like the Swiss Alps, uh, what he meant. But every other guy there, and of course I didn't want to look like the weak link, every other guy's like, yeah, let's do the fun stuff. And I had it in my mind. I was like, there's something hard. I'm getting off my bike and I'm, ro- I'm walking it because I, I do not want to wreck. And it wasn't long before we came to this gully, a very steep decline going to a very steep incline. And it wasn't even a path there. Like the only thing you'd ride on, I felt like, were these fist side size rocks. And they weren't even like river rock. They were like jagged rock that you throw on the side of a hill to stop erosion. And they were going down that really fast, going up the other side. And I thought, surely someone else is going to walk this gully. But one by one, each pastor shot down the gully and shot right back up the other side till the only one left was me. And I'm like, all right, am I going to walk this thing and be like, do the walk of shame or am I going to ride it? And I said, all right, I'm going to ride it. And I'm just going to hit this bike and I'm going to go down the hill. I'm not hitting my brake until I'm up on the other side. But it wasn't long before I realized not hitting the brake meant that I was going way too fast. And so I don't know about you, but the only bikes I had ever ridden in my life, the way that you brake is by pedaling backwards. Y'all know those bikes? It's like the bikes you learn on. That's all I'd ever had. But apparently mountain bikes, you don't pedal backwards to brake. They actually have them on the handlebars. And so I was going down this gully way too fast, needing to slow down. I didn't have confidence in my ability. So you know what I did? I did what any normal human being would do. I I hit the brake. But the brakes don't even, like, it's on both handlebars. They don't even work the same wheels. I didn't realize this. So when I hit the brakes and my lack of confidence, I actually hit the brake for the front wheel and not the back wheel. And so I had all this momentum going behind me. I was going down this hill. I hit the brake. The front wheel stopped, but all that momentum, like, continued on. And the back wheel, like, went over my head, and I tumbled all the way to the bottom of that gully. Uh, the, the, the fourth was not with me that day. I, um, I separated my shoulder three degrees. I broke two ribs. And typically, if you're riding on a road, you get road rash, but I had like rock rash, like all down my side. And I got to the bottom, caught my composure. I was like, I think I'm done. (laughs) And so I had to walk like three and a half miles back to my car that way. What happened? Why? One, I hit the wrong brake. But what happened ultimately is I didn't have confidence there. And that lack of confidence led me to wreck. And I think there is a spiritual metaphor here is that when we lack confidence in God, it causes us to compromise our faith and to wreck our lives. When we lack confidence in God, it leads us to compromise our faith. And we see this with David in chapter 27. And this is hard because we have been talking, even as far as last week, about David's faithfulness. Last week we said that David made good decisions because he was influenced by the word of God and the faithfulness of God. But when we read last week's passage in chapter 26, we begin to see a crack in his resolve. And he is thinking that he might need to leave Israel and head off to the Philistines. Why was there a change in David? Why was there a a, a crack in his confidence of God's goodness? I think to some extent, this is just human frailty. I think oftentimes we find ourselves in constant pressure, and this constant pressure leads us to grow weary. For how many years now has David been running from Saul, sleeping on the ground, trying to feed his men, trying to stay out of his grasp? And I can just imagine how tired he was of that. And thinking, this is never going to end. This is the lot of my life until I die. And that type of mindset, that type of thought due to the pressure he was in led him to crack. His confidence in God was hurt and it led him to flee into the arms of God's enemies, the Philistines. I think oftentimes we don't realize the pressure that we're under. This year has been crazy, hasn't it? With the pandemic and the election and the economy turning and and everything happening, 
Nothing is as it normally is. The fact that I'm looking at, at like a sea of masks yells that at me right now. And I don't know about you, but like, I don't think about stress in my mind, but I feel the stress in my shoulders. I feel the stress in my neck. And I think when we find ourselves in this constant pressure of life, oftentimes our confidence in God begins to crack just before we compromise our faith. It might be the pandemic for you. It might be a situation at work or at school for you. It might be, it, it might be a difficult relationship for you. But whatever it is, that constancy of pressure, if we are not careful and intentional, then we're going to end up cracking and compromising. We see that one of the reasons why David compromised was because he was removed from the people of God. Look at what it says. We're going to go back a chapter and look at the build-up to David going to the Philistines. In 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse uh, really kind of begins in verse 19. It says, Now may the Lord the king... So David is speaking to King Saul. He just escaped his grasp. And David says to King Saul, Now may the Lord the king please hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has inclined you against me, then may he accept an offering. But if it is people, may they be cursed in the presence of the Lord. For today they have banished me from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go and worship other gods. What is David saying in chapter 26? He's saying people have, have filled Saul's mind against David. And David, as a result, has been on the run, and he feels like there is no other place to go to to find rest, to find escape from Saul, except if he runs to the Philistines into the presence of other gods, saying, go and worship other gods. David speaks and says, they are pushing me away from the Lord's presence and from the Lord's inheritance. We have to realize the way that faith worked in the Old Testament, the way that the community of faith worked, that everything in the Hebrews' life was designed around their faith in God, that they had the prophets proclaiming the word of the God to the people, the priests ministering to the people on behalf of God. They had the tabernacle where they could see the sights and smell the smells and find forgiveness of their sins. They had the holy days where they gathered together to worship God. They had a Sabbath on a regular occurring weekly basis that reminded them of their faith in God and how is God who provides for them. Whenever Saul was chasing after David, David was essentially removed from that community of faith. And we find that being removed from that community of faith ended up having a detrimental impact on David's confidence in God. It pushed him into the arms of, of God's enemies, the Philistines. I think that we have the same thing happen in us, that sometimes we find ourselves and we find our confidence in God is hurt when we find ourselves removed from the people of God, removed from God's church. Think of it in this way. Uh, there was a recent poll that was done by the State of the Bible Institute. It was a, it was a, it was a uh, State of the Bible was a poll that they did trying to gauge America's interaction with the Bible. And they did, a, they did a poll trying to find out what the pandemic did to people's time in the Bible. Because you would just think that all the excuses for being in your Bible would be taken away, right? You're at home. You're not going to work. You, you know, nothing, you can't go to any, you can't go eat out, you can't go to the movies, there's nothing to do, you can't gather with people at all. Even church is put on pause. So you would think that that would be the optimal time for people to run to the Word of God, to treasure the Word of God, to, to, to grow in the Word of God. But that's not what happened. This, this is what the poll found. The state of the Bible polling found that as the first week of June, Scripture engagement among adults had fallen from 27.8% to 22.6%. You say, well, that's not too bad, like five points. 
But that represented some 13.1 million Americans who are no longer consistently interacting with the Bible in a way that shaped their choices and transformed their relationship with God and others. You catch that? That at a time when churches went in lockdown and they couldn't gather together to worship with the saints, you would think that people's Bible reading would, would skyrocket. But the very fact that they were removed from worshiping with the saints of God meant that they found themselves further away from God and impacting even their, their daily worship with God through reading the Bible. We find that when we are not worshiping with the church, when we are not engaging with the church, we will find ourselves having a, a, a breach in our confidence that slowly we will have our trust in God attacked and this will lead us eventually to compromise. Christ Community Church, what is your view of church? Last night we had an event at our house. It was called a Falling in Step with CCC because it's fall and we were talking about our values. And, and we had one woman and one man stood up. One, the women met in the morning. The guys met in the evening. And they were talking about our values as a church. And one of our values is that of the pulpit. This piece of furniture here, which represents the proclamation of God's word in the gathered body of Christ. And we said for our church, this aspect of worship, this part of the life of the believer is so central to who we are as Christians. We have to value it. We have to make it a priority in our lives that it shouldn't be a question on Sunday morning or even Saturday night. What are we going to do tomorrow? That when we wake up in the morning, it's like, all right, let's go to church. That when we go to bed Saturday night, our minds are prepared and ready to go. It's not a choice because it's a part of who we are. And we realize that this is the place where the saints come together. They sing the praises of God. They pray prayers to God. We, we partake of the Lord's Supper together. And we hear the word proclaimed. And that it's those acts in the life of the believer which is the benchmark of the week. It's how the rest of the week is gauged that we are falling in step and in line with our God, and we are reminded of God's faithfulness. We are reminded of God's goodness. David was removed from that, and that led him to doubt God's faithfulness, and it led him to compromise his faith. We also see another reason why David had a, had a breach in his confidence with God. We see that in verse 27, chapter 27, verse 1. David said to himself, one of these days I will be swept away by Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I will escape from himself. Do you hear what, what David said there? David said to himself. Why did David begin to lack confidence in God? It's because he was listening more to himself than listening to the word of God. He was listening more to himself than looking at the faithfulness of God in his life. And we find that we oftentimes do the same thing in our lives, that we begin to listen to the words and the scenarios that we fill our minds with rather than listening to the word of God and looking to the faithfulness of God. How do we do that? I think oftentimes we'll know a meeting is coming up. And knowing that this meeting is coming up, it kind of builds some anxiousness within us. And I know this is what I do. I begin to think about what that other person will say. And it's never positive. And then I think about how I'm going to re respond to that person who responded negatively. And, and I always am like working on the perfect thing to say. Or I'll look at a situation and, and a situation just seems almost hopeless, and I begin to think thoughts like, this is never going to get better, or this is just my luck, or things will never change, or I'll say things like, I can't go on, or I'll justify my actions, and I say, I had no choice. What, are, what am I doing when I do those things? I'm talking to myself rather than listening to the Word of God, rather than looking for the faithfulness of God. David had no reason not to trust God here. 
Time and time and time again, God had proved faithful to him. But he was listening to others. He was listening to himself. And that led him to lack confidence in God. It makes me think of Psalm 42. This is one of the things that David did at a different point in his life. And Psalm 42 is almost this, this psalm of depression that David is, is singing where he's thinking about how hard things are, how bad things are gotten. And then in the very last verse of that chapter, Psalm 42, verse 11, David lifts up his voice and he says, Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Whenever we find ourselves filling our minds with that self-talk, leading ourselves into our own little state of spiritual depression and anxiety, whenever we be, imagine ourselves having to stand up for ourselves because there's no one else out there to do it, what do we need to do? We need to begin preaching truth to ourselves and say, why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why am I lacking faith here? And as David did in Psalm 42, we need to remind ourselves to put our hope in God, who's our Savior. Do not allow the voices in your own mind. Don't allow that self-talk to lead you to lack the faithfulness of our God and the goodness of our God. Let us preach truth to ourselves. Because if we don't, if we begin to lack trust in God's goodness and faithfulness, if we lose that confidence in God, it does lead us to compromise. What happens in David's story? David goes to the king of Gath, Achish. This is not the first time that David has run to Achish, is it? We saw that he did this back in chapter 21. As soon as he left Saul's presence, he was escaping from Saul he runs directly to the king of Gath. In fact, the king of Gath was about to put like David's head on a platter. He's like, isn't this a guy that killed all my countrymen? Didn't he kill my, my champion Goliath? And so David had to act crazy and escape. Ran back to Israel. But here he is going back to the same king, back to the same city, seeking asylum a second time. You might ask why was he accepted this time? Probably because he had an army with him. And he had like a, a band of mercenaries that the king of Gath could utilize to his own benefit. And so that's what the king of the Philistines does. The king of Gath sits David and his men out to Ziklag, out to the borders of his own kingdom to live as his mercenary army. And what does David do? In this story, David goes out on these raiding parties. And he doesn't raid inside the land of Judah. He doesn't raid Israel, but rather he continues to raid Israel's enemies. He would go out to the Amalekites who, who were the enemies of Israel, and he would raid them. He would raid these other nomadic tribes who would attack Israel, and he would fight Israel's enemies inside the Philistine territory. Why did David do this? Well, one... <laughs> The king of Gath expected things from David. If you're my mercenary army, I want you to bring me stuff. And so David would attack these enemy tribes and collect all their herds and their clothes and their wealth, and then he would deliver them back to the king of Gath. But this is what David had to do in his compromise. What David had to do is make sure that there was no one left to tell the tale. David had to go in and kill all the witnesses, not just soldiers, but also the families of the soldiers as well. You see what was going on here? David lacked trust in God, and so what did he do? He went back to that old sin of thinking that he could find sanctuary with Saul's enemies. We do the same thing in our own lives, that oftentimes when we are at our wit's end and we are lacking confidence in God, we go back and we turn back to our old sins, to our old ways of life. The Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter 26 says in verse 11, 
that as a dog returns to its vomit, so also a fool repeats his foolishness. That's very vivid, isn't it? Kind of disgusting. No one likes to see that. A dog returning to its vomit is just like us when we go back to an old sin and we go back to an old state of not trusting in God. But whenever we lack confidence in God and His goodness, that's exactly what we are going to do. That's what David did, and he went back to that old lie that he can find comfort in God's enemies. But we also find that this action, this lack of confidence in God, led David to compromise his faith. When David went to those enemy tribes and he killed every man and woman and all the witnesses, was that what God intended? Some people will say, well, that's what God asked the Israelites to do in the book of Judges, but that was something different. That was, that was an act of, of, of a, a ritual cleansing that God was doing, and it's very complicated to mention that here because we don't have time to go into it, but that's not what David was doing. What was David's motivation in killing all these people? His motivation was simply that he did not want to be found out. David, this hero of the faith, became what the people in Israel accused him of, a, a criminal. There is an old saying in the church that I grew up in. It was a, a very small country church, and they said this phrase all the time. They said that sin will take you further than you want to go. It will leave you longer than you want to say, and sin will will cost you far more than you're willing to pay. And we feel and we can see that this is what's going on with David. David only wanted rest from King Saul, but he didn't trust in God to give him that rest, so he had to take it himself. And that sin of taking it himself led him on this path of compromising his faith time and time and time again. And notice what happens here. That sin has this ability to grow. It takes us further than, it want, than we want to go. So David thought, well, I'm just going to hang out here in Ziklag and attack God's enemies. But when we begin to read the first few verses of chapter 28, David's ruse is found out almost. The king, uh, Gath Achish, calls David in and says, David, the Philistines, all the Philistine cities, we are amassing our armies, and we are going to... We're going to launch a major offensive against Israel, and I want you right there with me. You're my best fighter. You're my best bodyguard. I want you right there with me as we are attacking Israel. David's bluff was called in chapter 28, and we find that whenever we lack confidence in God and we begin to compromise our faith, it's going, our sin is going to ask more and more and more of us. But here's the good news. Though this is a godless chapter, though we don't see any mention of God in these verses in this chapter, what we know from the larger story is that God did not leave David. That though David stumbled, God was faithful. And through the acts, he was bringing David back to himself. If you find yourself this morning beyond doubting God and you find yourself in a compromised place, know that God has not left you. But He is still there and He is calling you back to Himself. Why? Because our God is faithful. Christ Community Church, let us stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we do praise your name that you are faithful, that you never leave us, you never forsake us, that you are always right there with us, even in the midst of us trying to run from you, that you will never let us go because that is who you are in your nature and that is your great love for us. So Father, may we turn our eyes to your great works of your great acts of faithfulness 
And may our confidence in you not be shaken. I wanted to end with Psalm 100 today. Um, so here it is. Let's sing it. All people that on earth do dwell Sing to the Lord with cheerful voice Him serve with mirth His praise forth tell Come ye before Him and rejoice For why the Lord our God is good His mercy is forever sure His truth at all times firmly stood And shall from age to age endure Amen. All right, remain standing. We will not be much longer. Don't forget, if you are checking your children into Children's Church or Nursery next week, there's a letter on the middle aisle for you. Take it home, read over it. And we are going to worship together up here next week, and our kids are going to have a place to be, and uh, they're going to have their own service. But don't let... That, hmm, how do I say this? We value our kids. And if you want your kids to stay in the service, they are more than welcome to stay in the service. Um, but we also realize that some of you are like, I haven't heard a sermon since March. <laughs> so uh, that option is available for you next week. Christ Community Church, let us receive our benediction this morning. In the book of Psalm chapter 131, the psalmist says, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. You are dismissed.